let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing today? Good. Some little spurt of news got the adrenaline going. Yeah. And unexpected news, Bruce. I wasn't expecting to hear this, but it looks like Chris John Shannon of TSN uh, is reporting that Chris Russell has signed a one-year deal with the orders. This news was first broken by Hart Levine of Puckpedia. Not normally a guy who breaks trade rumors, but he broke this saying the orders were looking at a one-year deal with Russell for expansion draft reasons. So Hart got to the heart of the matter uh, right away in that initial tweet. And it's looking like uh, we're hearing multiple reports. It's looking from different Oilers insiders about 1.25 million, something in that range, Bruce, Mm -hmm. for uh, Russell um, right uh, for this coming 2021-22 season. Not for this. He signed for this year, $4 million cap hit, but he's actually earning $2.5 million this year. And one of one million's already been paid on a signing bonus. So, Bruce, what do you what do you make of it? What's your thought? Well, it uh, certainly puts paid to the idea that the Oilers might be trading out Russell um, for either another uh, contract or simply for cap space, uh, taking advantage of the fact that much of his contract is prepaid. Uh, this. Everything about this says to me, Oilers want to keep the player now. Yeah. And maybe they want to themselves take advantage of the pre... Maybe Daryl Cates has finally got sick of paying the front end of front-loaded contracts. Uh, But I think the Oscar Kleffbaum injury situation changed everything in terms of uh, which way Ken Holland might have gone with the the Russell situation. it seems early to me to be worrying about that expansion draft. Like there are other solutions out there, and and uh, I mean now they've got a solution, which is great. But you know, I just don't see what the rush was. But if the price is reported at one to one point five million, well, that's a lot easier to swallow than the cap hit of four million that the Oilers have been carrying for this player for the past four years. And you know, as a as a respected veteran defenseman, you expect a little bit more than the NHL minimum. And I mean, that's where 1 million is. Uh, and 1.5, well, we don't know where it's going to land in there. But but the, the price point for what they're doing and why they're doing it uh, makes a lot more sense. And uh, I guess the player has read the market to the point that he knows that his rich contract is in the past now. And uh, uh, he's just looking for... a you know, a little bit of longer term security and uh, he just got that at least one more year in, uh, in either Edmonton or Seattle, basically. I don't, I didn't mind um, the last contract that Russell signed. I didn't love it. I wish it had been for a year less was, mm-hmm. I think, my take on it at the time. Strong feeling about that. But, you know, mm-hmm. I was willing to live with that deal. And I think that, that Russell has given the orders value maybe not full value i mean full value that's hard to measure but i think he's given he's given he's been at least an average nhl defenseman for the edmonton oilers uh in that time period an average defenseman would make what about three million a year so he's he's and i think in the you know his his play i i noticed the decline in his play last year i think his his play dropped off a little bit last year and um i think it's going to probably happen again this year and next year so in terms of just a player like bringing in a player for one more year, I'm not sure, but you know the owners are in a very odd and difficult situation with the expansion draft. They've got a lot of longtime defensemen on the team, but it looks like a lot of them might not be available um, in the expansion draft. So, which could put Edmonton in a really hard position. So, Larson, he's on the last Adam Larson last year of his deal. Um, Chris Russell, he is on the last year of his deal. Uh, we we have Tyson Berry, who was signed a newcomer, one-year deal. So the players that we know for sure are are going to be signed up and would be uh, eligible for expansion are Darnell Nurse, um, Caleb Jones, Ethan Bear, I'm assuming, um, and Oscar Clefbaum. But will Clefbaum, there, there's some questions about whether Clefbaum will even be able to be eligible for expansion. Uh, for So if Clefbaum isn't eligible, then they only have Jones, Bear, and Nurse. And you do not want to lose in expansion one of 
Jones, Barrett, or Nurse. I do not. I don't think. I think the Oilers need are going to need some options, and uh, you, you have to have a player who's either played seventy games over two years, or um, is it forty games this coming year right. could be prorated. So that might be hard to do with the Oilers. The, the the current setup where Barry and Larson might not be back next year, might not sign new contracts. Um, so Chris Russell is uh, signed and he is going to play. So, um, and with Clefbaum, a veteran, not likely to play, you're probably going to need Russell this year. So I think the yeah. options were starting to collapse in on Ken Holland, the realistic options, like, okay, who do we have under contract? Who's actually going to get ice time this year? Who can I squeak in? Like, could I squeak in a, a new player like William Logason to play 40 games? Well, that's a little bit unlikely, like it could happen, but, um, could I, could we, could we sign another player? or trade for a player. That's a possibility, but that, you know, that's an, that's an uncertainty and an unknown. And I sure don't want to be in a position of overpaying um, for that kind of player. And Chris Russell on a one-year deal um, as a seventh defenseman a year from now, I could probably live with that. And then I'm really covered off an expansion. So I, I think I can think along with the GM on this one. And f- so what I see from Russell Bruce is like, in terms of his points per game in the last two years, he's in the bottom right in the bottom, like third pairing. He's right in the middle of third pairing defenseman for points per game at even strength. His puck moving, especially when he's on the right side, is is really weak. I'm not thrilled with him getting a lot of ice time for the Oilers. I wish, uh, uh, you know, I would prefer that they replace him. Um, but his defense is still, um, he, he may be the best defensive defenseman on the Oilers still in terms of covering the slot, playing positionally sound hockey. He and Adam Larson are in, you know, they're both in the same category, being really good. And with Clefbaum out, um, at least this year, um, I'm glad Russell's around because if you if Nurse or Jones get hurt, um, you'll need someone to plug into the top four. And Chris Russell, I think, can hang in there defensively. He's not going to get eaten alive defensively, which is kind of job one for a defenseman playing top four minutes. And I think he, he hangs in there defensively. He's also a huge guy on their PK. Um, so, so with Clefbaum out, you're going to need Chris Russell to kill penalties. Like it's going to be huge to have him this year. So this year it's, it makes sense to keep him for expansion reasons. It makes sense to keep him. And I know like one of the things that has always been held against him is his Corsi, his Fenwick and those kinds of numbers. But if you look at his, this last year that he just played in terms of just focus on how the team did on the ice at even strength when Lars Russell was on the ice in terms of Corsi against Fenwick against high danger scoring chances against and goals against Russell was the best defenseman, except except for Corsi, the one stat, which I think is the, the, the least significant of all those stats. He, he, the team did the best at suppressing shots when Chris Russell was on the ice. So again, I speak, I think that speaks to his ability to defend. And so your third pairing D man who can defend like hell. I mean, I think that's a, uh, every team used to have that kind of guy, maybe in the modern NHL, that's passe and it's not a good idea to have him, but I still see some value in the player. So I, I can live with this, this contract one year at 1.25 million. If that's what it is. I, I, I really do think for expansion reasons, it makes it good sense. Well, uh, last year he and Matt Benning were one, two on the team in all of the shot and goal suppression stats. Of course, Benning is gone. You know, if I, given my druthers, I would rather sign Benning to the two times one million dollar contract that he signed with Nashville. But um, Bingo, yeah, that's gone. Uh, but um, uh, Russell actually was number one on the team by a good margin uh, at five on five goals against per 60, just one point six two goals against per 60. And Benning was the only guy in the same time zone as him at one point eight one. Next on the team was Caleb Jones at 2.56. Like that's more than 50% more goals against per hour than Russell. So his goal suppression numbers, and of course those are subject to to it, it's uh, the, the error bar is wider on goals just because there's so many fewer goals. Um, but uh, that's the uh, uh, the four years that he's been in Edmonton, he's been number one or number two in the team in that stat in three of those four years. And clearly, that's the strength of his game: is is defending the slot and, and uh, uh, <clears throat> not giving the other team free shots. And of course, the weakness of his game, as you point out, is uh, anything to do with the uh, offensive side of things and getting the puck moving north. So that's where uh, 
uh, uh, some folks have a huge issue with his game, and they're not wrong. You know, uh, he's a limited player, but uh, he's not without value. He's got some some good. Uh, he's got some good value, and th that's five on five that I cited. Now, of course, also he's a key on the penalty kill unit, and with the loss, especially of Oscar Kleffbaum, I think again that changed Holland's priorities in terms of what to do with Chris Russell. All of a sudden, he needs a veteran defenseman. And he needs a left shot defenseman. He needs a guy who can kill penalties. And Chris Russell is all those things. And it's um, uh, maybe the maybe was the uh, path of least resistance. And at least he got the the price point down to something tolerable in year two. The Oilers will have to live yeah. with that four million dollar cap hit this year, though. And so that uh, any chance they had of uh, creating some flexibility there. I mean, they could still trade him, but I, I, I don't see him as being a, a more viable trade asset now that he's got an extra year on his deal. But Well, unless there's another team looking for an expansion kind of deal. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't see this, this, I don't think this deal happens on the Oilers if Russell doesn't have that expansion. Uh, if, if the expansion draft isn't weighing over the Oilers right now, I don't think this happens. But, you know, you know it's, we've, I've always kind of assumed the Oilers were going to protect um, four defensemen with Clefbaum injured, that's less likely. Mm -hmm. I think it's more likely it's three. We also have Puglia Yarvi coming back to the team, and um, yeah, there's changes. a chance they're going to need to. If he plays well, um, if Cassian plays well, you know, there's a chance they're going to need to protect five forwards or six or seven forwards. Uh, probably not Cassian, but th they might really need to protect Yessa Puglia Yarvi. Um, to protect the big three, obviously, pull the RV. Is Yamamoto? Does he need? Yeah, they have to protect Yamamoto. And of the big three, uh, Nugent Hopkins, his contract's expiring. So there's a small chance that they could pull an end run and not uh, not renew him until after the expansion draft. But I'm not sure that's the way Ken Holland deals, to tell you the truth. Uh, anyway, so. Uh, it could be that, um, I mean, if cleft bomb is, uh, if it's serious and it's long term, then all of a sudden 441 changes to 731. And the only way it changes back is if they decide to, to re sign either Adam Larson or uh, Tyson Berry to, uh, to a renewal. So there's still, I mean, there's a lot of balls in the air, and there will be right up to that expansion draft, I would imagine. You know, the one point that you make that kind of sticks with me about the whether this is a good idea or not is like, did you have to rush? Did you have to do this? And, you know, it's almost like the same thing with the Mike Smith mm -hmm. uh, deal. The, these two deals, you have to, you kind of wonder like, uh, geez, maybe they should have just waited. Could they wait it? Now, we're not, we don't have all the knowledge though. Like Ken Hollins, he's, he's looking at the market. He's turning over every stone, presumably thinking about the team next year players they could bring in what makes sense was doesn't make sense and so i'm i'm gonna i'll give him the benefit of the doubt because i like I, i'm kind of iffy on both of these things i'm not in love with either of the deals but i'm not against mm -hmm. them either so I, i'll just benefit of the doubt to the person with more knowledge than me on this one and and say this is this is likely making sense for the orders both the smith deal and the the russell deal i part of me thinks i it does stick with me. Maybe you should wait longer, maybe wait it out. But on the other hand, it's this isn't Ken Holland's first rodeo. And nope. presumably he knows what the market has and he's looked at all the options. He and Keith Gretzky, these aren't, these are in, intelligent, able, experienced men uh, at, their, at their work. So hopefully they're getting it right. And I suspect that they probably are. Well, and let's remember that he's dealing with uh, living, breathing humans at the other end of the transactions too. And if there's one thing I noticed about um, uh, Holland's treatment of his players last year, is that uh, uh, he gave them, a, you know, he gave them a sh fair shake, and you know, he let them know the lay of the land that, you know, when he signed that they were going to get a chance at making the team, and that, you know, and they actually got that chance, and, and so on. And in this case, he's dealing with, you know, the two oldest veterans on his club, Mike Smith and Chris Russell. And in each case, he convinced the guy to take a hefty pay cut. And in each case, uh, what he what he brought to the table was uh, 
was early resolution to what for them would have been, you know, potentially a long-term question mark. Now, you know, Mike Smith knows what he's doing next year and Chris Russell knows what he's doing the year after that. And you or I or Joe Fan might say, well, he could have hung the guy out to dry, maybe got a slightly better deal or, or something different. But again, I said, I'm not sure that's the way Ken Holland rolls. I think he's he tries to be upfront with people and let them know where they stand. And that's what he's done. He, he did give, like, just, I'm just looking at the list of players that he gave a fair shake to. I mean, Sam Gagne got into 36 games. Marcus Granlin, 34. Negard, 33, would have been more if he hadn't gotten hurt. Pearson, 13, would have been more if he hadn't gotten hurt. Yurcho, 12 games. Brand, even Brandon Manning, he, he got... He, Brandon Manning, he got into nine games. Can you imagine, Bruce? Can you believe that the Oilers were in such a position last year that they needed to play Brandon Manning nine games at the start of last year? I mean, I don't think he should have played any. I would have played Lagosin instead, personally, but uh, that's where they were. Bruce, let's talk about um, Dave Tippett's really great interview on uh, Oilers Now. Sure. He, he covered a lot of country. And I really, I really loved what Tippett had to say about Yesapulia Yarvi, mm -hmm. and especially in contrast to uh, <laughs> Drew Remenda's interview. And I, I really like Drew Remenda's work. I think he's a, mm -hmm. got a lot of hockey knowledge and tells it like it is. And I know that the Drew Remenda fan club isn't isn't um, gigantic. It's not overflowing, Bruce. But mm -hmm. I I am in it. I like his work, and I, li I especially like him on orders now because he just really gives the gives the goods. And I thought Drew gave the most honest, forthright um, opinion on what hockey insiders, and I'm and I'm going to expand that to the coaching staff, the managerial, maybe not Shirelli, but many people in management and all the reporters around the Oilers, mm -hmm. what they thought of Yesapuli RV. We've kind of heard hints of it and negative comments and this and that comment. Drew just laid it on the line and he said that kid was too immature. Mm -hmm. essentially. To, let, to, me read, let me read to you read what exactly what he said. Yeah. I didn't think he was smart enough. I thought his hockey, hockey IQ was low. I didn't think he had good work ethic. I didn't think he was putting as much into his game, investing into his craft like we saw Leon, like we saw Connor. I always thought to myself, self, you know, Jesse, if you would just look at those two guys and how hard they practice and put that into your game, you'd be a hell of a lot better. I always thought he was an entitled player. I've never been a fan of the guy. So I just think he That's Drew said uh... Drew said the truth about what the McClellan coaching staff thought of Pulleyarvi. There, Drew's tight with that group of people. So that's how I'm reading that. And maybe I'm wrong. So I'm just mm -hmm. I'm, I don't know. I don't know what was said, but that's my take. He just told us projection. the truth, Bruce, about what the coaching staff and what the coaching staff was telling to reporters who were then kind of leaking out and putting out about Pugliarvi in public. I, I don't have really a sin. I, I have maybe a doubt that I'm right about this, but that's about it. I think this is that's what happened there. So obviously a problem with the coaching staff and the player that they, they just couldn't be worse. Couldn't be a worse evaluation of a young player. You know, all of the. Yeah, they just they just could barely stand the guy, evidently. So no wonder he laughed. No wonder Pulley Harvey leaves. And thank goodness, again, thank goodness that he laughed. Thank goodness that he uh, decided, like, get out of here, get out of get out of Dodge. And because this could have been what the players were thinking of him too, the other players on the team. And I think that there's a really really good chance that's the case as well. This is what everybody was thinking. So good for him getting out of Dodge. And good for him turning it around in Finland. And the exciting thing to me was Tippett's lavish praise. You know, just real enthusiasm for his game. Because Dave Tippett is a smart hockey guy. Very, a lot of acumen, very acute in terms of when he looks at a player, knowing what, how that player is going to translate to the NHL and what he's going to do and how he can use him, Tippett, in the lineup. So to hear Tippett's enthusiasm after watching him most games this year in Finland was very gratifying to me and, and gives me a lot of hope that uh, yes, a pulley RV uh, version 2.0 is going to is going to break through on the Oilers in a way that the the younger version, probably a lot to do with his own fault, didn't break through. wasn't ready, wasn't mature enough, wasn't wasn't up for it quite then, but is now maybe. 
No, well, Tippett said he's taken a lot of responsibility for that himself in terms of what went on before. He, he said he took the fifth and said, I, you know, I, I wasn't firsthand witness to that. I don't know. I'm just going on hearsay, he said. I've heard stories, but he's taken a lot of responsibility for that himself. He knows he came over. He was a young guy, didn't know the language, lots of things to learn, and not just on the ice. It overwhelmed him a little bit. But then he talked about him going home, and then he says, you watch him play now, he's a different player. He's a dominant player in the Finnish league. He's taken responsibility. His English is good. He's anxious to come over and prove that he can be a good player in the best league in the world. He's willing to play anywhere we want him to play, play any role we want him to play. He just wants to come over and fit in and be a good player for the Edmonton Oilers. So that's the coach's kind of official position. He went on to talk about how he was a top five-on-five five and power play uh, in the Finnish league and was even killing penalties. So he's really sort of broadened his game from the sounds of all that. And so I uh, just talked about him maturing as a 22-year-old player. And, and to tremendous credit, he also talked about that. Yes. He expected a, a more mature version of, uh, of Yessa version 2.0. So, uh, so we'll see. But, uh, but uh, I, to my ears, Tippett said all the right things about cleaning the slate and giving the guy a shot. And uh, hopefully, some of the, you know, the team will get the same message, and uh, and we'll get a fresh start with this guy because certainly the the mouthwatering talent is still there. I haven't been watching him full games, but I've been seeing some of these highlights, and man, he's still got the, you know. Got the size, the speed, the skill, you know, and creativity. I didn't, I didn't mind him on the ice, Bruce, in his first incarnation with the Oilers. I mean, I just felt like in the last year, especially the last few months, something was wrong. Something was, he was falling down all the time. And then he was, had to play with Lucic all the time, of course. But I, I have to say Tippett's little Tippett's little spiel there almost brought a tear to my eye. It was so, uh, so, so uh, such good news. You know, and as for Drew, I'm not criticizing Drew in the least for being honest. I, I love Drew's brutal honesty. I think it's his strength as a commentator, and he should do more of it. And all hockey commentators should do as much of it as possible because a lot, I know a lot of them are, um, you know, feel close to the team and that they can't really s speak their minds, but Drew does. And then he did, as you say. He, he He's saying, you know, he's listening. Drew is listening to Tippett, what Tippett's saying. He's putting some weight in it. And thinking, well, maybe there's a chance here. Maybe there really is a chance with this player because everyone's seen it. Players turn it around, especially that age. There's lots oh, of examples. It's not unusual. So, yeah, brutal honesty is a good way to put it, as any. It certainly was brutal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think it was. I think that the opinion of Pulley was brutal at that time. They just really didn't like him as a as a professional athlete. They didn't think he, he was um, mm -hmm. acting in the right way. He was breaking this, that, and the other unwritten rule of the team left, right, mm -hmm. and center, it sounds like. And it's not going to, that doesn't go over well. Um, well. Anytime someone kicks out the entitled word, uh, there's trouble. <laughs> there's trouble. Yeah, ain't that the truth. All right, uh, Bruce, he also talked about Kyle Turris, the Oilers' new third line center, who could well be on a we we could see a line. I think I think one or two of these wingers will actually be up with Connor McDavid, but we could see a line of Tyler Ennis, Yes, Apuli RV, and Kyle Turris as their mm -hmm. third line, which would be that's that's really exciting news for the Oilers, if you ask me. But um what do you what did he say about Turris, Dave Tippett? Well, reading between the lines, it sounds to me like uh, Puller, Yarby, and Turris are going to be joined at the hip for at least the start of the season. Yeah. I don't think he's going to. I don't think he's going to uh, um, uh, gift Yessa a spot in the top six. He's going to give him a chance to prove himself. You know, on a lower line, playing against lower competition, but with a skilled center now, right? He's not going to be lining up with Riley Shea next year. He's going to be lining up with with Kyle Turris. And uh, he had good things to say about Turris and just basically about the uh, uh, about that third line uh, generally. He said the NHL has gone to a top nine forwards and then a role-playing fourth line, whether it's energy or penalty killers. We were a top six and a bottom six last year, and of that there's no doubt. The Oilers had five guys that scored at a first-line rate and seven guys that scored at a fourth-line rate, nobody in between. So with... Bringing in 
tourists and and with the addition of Pulley Arby, and there he puts them right in the same sentence, we feel more comfortable with the top nine in offensive situations and five on five situations. The center man, being tourist, is really the key to that because he can drive a line. And they talked about his previous experience with him, not but in the world championships in Belarus a few years back, and how, especially in that latter situation, he filled the exact role that he now envisions him playing for the Oilers, basically a center on the third line, can take face-offs on the right side, can chip in in multiple situations, can kill a penalty, can play on the second power play unit, can score at even strength, you know, and, and that's how, how he's envisioning him, and he's saying a real smart player in all situations. So he, uh, uh, he had good things to say about, uh, about Turris, and I wondered about that a little bit because he left Arizona as a very yeah. young player under a little bit of a cloud. Remember that trade yeah. that got forced to Ottawa? So he doesn't hold that against this player either, and, and it's, instead he's, he, he talked extensively about their ex- more recent experience in those world championships. And uh, So he's on board with this player. Uh, mentioned the right shot business, which is, I think it's good. They got at least one face-off guy that they can put on the right side of the ice, and and uh, uh, it, it's a, uh, um, in his view, a positive signing. And uh, uh, they think that these guys, um, a couple of them, they got at a pretty good price. Like this was a six million dollar a year player last year. Of course, he got bought out in Nashville. But the Oilers got him on the rebound for 1.65, and so you know that's that's at least you know an affordable contract. That's a contract that he could outperform if all these things that the coach sees in, in him come to pass. And it certainly appears he's going to get the opportunity. I'm I'm worried about uh, replacing Riley Shan on the PK. I just thought Riley Shan was the most important player, other than the goalie on the PK. He was fantastic. He really had great reads. He really knew how to do that system of forcing the players to the outside, um, cutting off cross-seam passes. So can Turris do that? Would Pogliarvi maybe be given a chance? It would be If they could do this job, go out there together, that would be really important to keep these guys in the game, to keep Pogliarvi. Like, you know, if you get a game with a lot of power plays and PKs, you can, you're on the third line. You could be sitting on the bench for 10, 15 minutes mm-hmm. in a row in real time, maybe even longer. And um, so I, I'd love to see, you know, I think Pugliarvi can kill penalties. He's just big, rangy guy. It, it's a, it's a, it's not rocket science. It's just hard work. And he and Torres together, maybe that'll work. Maybe we'll even see that. It was interesting that Tippett did mention that Pugliarvi had been killing penalties in, yeah. in Finland. So yeah, Torres' contract, Bruce, I've been doing this series um, on the best and worst contracts in the NHL. And in terms of like post lock, post 2012 lockout contracts, which is under the new CBA, which is right. still actually in play right now, pretty much. It hasn't changed much. I, I, I figured Ty, Taurus's contract was about the fifth worst contract, which is now lapsed. So there's some existing ones that might be worse. There are some existing ones that are worse. But, man, that was a terrible contract. They signed him at six years at $6 million, and he only played two years for them. And um, huge buyout cost for Kyle Turris. In, um, yeah, well, they're paying him more in Nashville not to play for him than Edmonton is paying him to play for them. And they're paying him for eight years, I think. Yeah, eight yeah, they got eight years at $2 million would be the... Uh, that would be the default rate. I don't know the exact bonuses and structure of his deal, but it would be somewhere in that range, eight times two. They should have gone another year with him, I think. Like maybe they were looking to sign Peter Angelo or Taylor Hall or something. I don't know what they were looking to do with that cap space. Or maybe they're just looking to shed money because they're worried about finances. But yep. um, man, it would have made sense to just gut it out one more year with Kyle Turris, if you ask me. Like, in retrospect, I was, you know, I didn't like Pouliot's game at all with the Oilers by the end, but in retrospect, it would have been good to keep him one more year. And we wouldn't still have him on the payroll this yeah, year. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, Bruce, I, I'm looking at these terrible contracts for a reason. Um, Ryan Nugent Hopkins' contract is coming up. And, um, any, you know, when we look at the players who have the worst contracts in the NHL, when they were signed, there was a shine in the GM's eye 
that they had signed a player, generally speaking, every bit as good as Ryan Nugent Hopkins in that moment. That's what they were thinking. Like, we've got our first line winger. Or we've got our first we've got our first line winger for five years or we've got our top center or top defenseman or top goalie for five, six years here. We are set. That's why I'm locking in this deal. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to get a sense of how common these deals are um, and who's got the most of them. So we, I, I talked a little bit last time about um, the worst deals. I'll just quickly review that the, the, the top, I'll give you the top 10 worst deals as I see it. Jeff Skinner, Sergei Bobrovsky, Brett Seabrook, Justin Falk, Louis Erickson, Milan Lucic, P.K. Subban, Martin Jones, Ryan Kessler, Andrew Ladd. Those are the top, the baddies right oh. now. But there's another category that that is very worrisome for NHL teams. And I'm glad to report that one of Edmonton's arch rivals, the San Jose Sharks, has three such contracts, Bruce. Eric Carlson, Brent Burns and Mark Edward Vlasic are all on massive, massive long-term deals. And all of them had a drop in play last year. Um, you know, so did uh, the Sharks. Huh? Yeah, and so did the Sharks. So, you know, uh, the, so the, 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 in terms of the iffy contracts, risky contracts, my top 10 are, are Carlson, Drew Doughty, Carey Price, Clay Keller, Matt Duchesne, Mark Edward Vlasic, Ryan Johansson. Brent Burns, Zach Parise, and Cam Atkinson. I think that's 10. And um, so these are players that are still good NHL players. All of them are good players still. Mm -hmm. All can help you win. But compared to their cap hits, if you're the GM and the, or a fan in those cities, you're, you have to be worried. And in San Jose, like I, I think like about a third of the players on, I have a list of 20 players here. I think about a third of them are probably going to, have some more peak or near peak seasons, be okay for a few more years at least. But I'm doubting any of them will be that way for the entire term of their contract. And I think most of them for the rest of their contract are going to be in that iffy territory. Um, and I'm glad that the Oilers, they don't have anyone on this list, Bruce. They yeah. don't have anyone. No, so, so people in oh. Edmonton will go on about Zach Cassian and about Chris Russell and about Alex Chase on those are little misses. Those hurt. Like if you miss on, if the orders miss on the Cassian contract, that's going to hurt and he would be close to, you know, but his contract isn't, it's not like Eric Carlson is signed for seven more years at 11.5 million. Now he's 30 years old and he's had, uh, he just had a bit of a down season. He was still really good though last year, but man, I, I just wonder what they're, if they had to do that all over again, would they do that? I wonder. Yeah, well, that's the thing. All these deals, I mean, I'm not sure how many more years Burns has got to go, but he's 34 years old last year. So he's got he's five, more years, five, five more years. Five more years. He's 35 years old. And Vlasic's got a ton of time to go on his, and he's 33 six, years old. Six more years, Bruce. So they're paying all these guys till they're almost 40 years old. Mm, Three no. defensemen. And, and I mean, what are they? How are they going to divest? Well, what? How? How do you divest? Like, well, I mean, I <laughs> yeah, I guess you know, if it's got one more year on a deal, like you know, um, yeah. what's his name, Paul Stastny, had a little bit of drop and play last year, but he he was still a good player. But he only had one more year on his deal, so you, you, they were able to trade him away. Vegas was to Winnipeg because they needed someone. So if it, like Chris Russell, I think the orders could have moved him this year. If they, you know, Bob Stoffer was just saying on Oilers now that he thinks they could have moved Russell if, but the cleft bomb injury changed that. So there are some bigger contracts. If there's just one year left, maybe you can move the guy, but you have four or five, like the tourist deal, right? They were looking down the barrel. It's, I think it's six more years of Kyle Turris yeah, at whatever four, it was. Four more, yeah. Uh, was, it, was it a six year deal? Originally a six year deal, and he played yeah. two of the years. So they were looking at four more years of, of Kyle Turris. Uh, what was his cap hit? It six was million. six million. So Nugent Hopkins, with this brings us to the Nugent. You know, um, still a lot of good players unsigned. Mike Hoffman, among others. Um, Travis Hamanick. The, the the market has been pretty tough on contracts. There wasn't a lot of long term contracts. Period handed out in this free agency period. Ty Taylor Hall couldn't get one. The only two people who did were Peter Angelo, a true number one defenseman. Or yeah, and um, Markstrom who I think is arguably a true number one goalie in the NHL right now. 
Nugent Hopkins isn't a true number one center. He is a true number one line winger, though. Um, I don't know how this is going to impact negotiation, negotiations with Nugent Hopkins. I, I would hope it, um, like we've heard anywhere on a long-term deal, anywhere from like $8 million at the top to about $6 million at the bottom is what he's er currently earning. Mm -hmm. And I think it should be very close to what he's earning currently if you go long-term with the player. He is a very good player. But in a flat cap NHL, uh, on a long-term deal for a player heading into his 30s, who is not a driver, who is a very good complementary player, a very good player, but not a driver of his own first line, um, I, I think that's a, a good price for Nugent Hopkins, one that makes sense, I would hope, for the player and and for the team. Because if they if they go like eight years at $7 million, Bruce, I just think they're, they're asking for trouble. You're just really asking for trouble. And I would I would prefer if they're going to give him a you know seven anything with a seven in it, in terms of his his uh, cap hit. Mm -hmm. I hope it's on a shorter term deal. Like okay, we'll give you your seven years, but at four or five years, five years tops, five years at seven million. I hear you. What's your What's your thought? Yeah, I was thinking when you were talking about seven, I was thinking yeah, four or five years would be all right at that price. I'm not sure about eight, so I think we're close to being on the same page and. I'm a big Nuge fan, like most Edmonton fans are. I mean, I I hope they work something out and he stays here long term, but uh, at you know at a reasonable price for boy, you know he deserves to be paid well, but uh, you know he's he's not the driver of the team. I mean, I I a comp I found for him that I'm comfortable with is Patrick Marlowe, uh, slightly earlier era. Uh, but he came into uh, San Jose as a, you know a second overall draft choice, so all of the you know all the hype and everything, uh, and uh, as a center, and ultimately uh, they stocked up with other centers: Joe Thornton, Joe Pavelski, Logan Couture, all played center. So Marlowe shifted over to the wing, and he became an excellent sidekick kind of winger, you know, that could score, set up goals, kind of do everything. But he wasn't necessarily the guy that was driving the line. And it took him a while to get going. Like the Nuge, he never hit 60 points in his career until he was 26 years old. And it took him a little longer to get paid. Like Nuge got his seven mil or six million a year right from age 21. Uh, but uh, Marlowe, for the last 12 years of his career until this year, and he just signed a one year extension for 700,000, which was a huge come down for this player. But he, he had uh, four different multi-year contracts that all started with a six. So, you know, he never really got big raises. He just maintained a very good, healthy uh, level of pay. But it wasn't like he got, you know, six on the first one and then eight and then ten. You know, it was like always in the six to seven million dollar range. And I thought that was reasonable good value for a very good player like him. Uh, but you can't be paying all of them as game breakers, right? I mean, the Oilers are paying McDavid and Dreisaitl to uh, to be the game breakers, and the rest of their players are, you know, mostly support players, very good ones. Because you're going to need not so good ones. But Nuge is a very good one. But I wouldn't say he's a he's a driver. You know, he just is a very valuable, versatile veteran player. And for the people who would, you know, go whole hog for Nuge, like, you know, eight years at eight million or whatever, they're willing to, to you know, I, here's the only thing I would say. Do you also like Kyler Yamamoto? What do you what do you mm -hmm. think about Ethan Bear? What do you think about Caleb Jones? Uh, what about Philip Broberg or Evan Bouchard if they turn out or Yosef Puliyarvi? Because if you go whole hog on the one player, that right. even if you love these other players, you can't keep them. You can't keep them. No, and, you just get rid of Chris Russell, Mike Smith. Uh, Alex Chase on and every other guy that you don't like. And then, you know, you wind he, up with 10, 10 players making the entire salary. <laughs> so, so Marlowe had his big scoring years between the ages of 26 and um, 32. He gets, mm -hmm. he gets between 86 and 86 points when he's 26 and he's in that range until he 32 and he gets 64. And mm -hmm. after that he gets, um, well, he still has a he he gets seventy points actually when he's thirty four. So it's a, he's at thirty four. So mm -hmm. he, and then he then he drops fifty seven, forty eight, forty six, forty seven. Right. So like the five year deal for Nuge, I'm not against paying him on a, like if he really wants that big cap hit, mm -hmm. give it go shorter term then go four years with him and give him 
give him the money that he wants. But then, you know, and the argument is, well, you, you can sign another deal then. Like, we're not right. saying you can't play after that. You Arnold can still did. get, yeah, you can still get contract after contract. But, you know, we, we have to have, we're willing to you to pay more, but it has to be lower term. And I just hope that Ken Holland um, and Nugent Hopkins are reasonable in this, but that Ken Holland is tough. Like, isn't, you know, he's he gave out some really bad contracts in Detroit, uh, especially towards the end, uh, mm -hmm. to Stephen Weiss and Franz Nielsen and Justin, Justin Abdelkader. Abdel he, he gave out three of the worst contracts of this 2012 yeah. to 2020 era, and he can't do that here. He's got to, you know, and I didn't like his offer on Markstrom, the seven years at $5 million. I didn't like that, um, you know, it was a lower cap hit, so that was good. But I did, uh, mm -hmm. I didn't. I just, I'm glad that I'm glad that fell through. Well, he does seem to be driving, um, driving the line a little harder during the flat cap era. You know, like to me, the two year deal he got pulled the RB on that has a chance to be a, a very good value contract. Yeah. Uh, the price point that he got tourists on on the rebound from the buyout was was pretty good. Uh, the price that he got Ennis for, you know, it was a little raise on the 800 grand that he got last year, but Ennis had a very nice year. And by, uh, I think the evolving wild, if I'm not mistaken, that projected him as being close to a $3 million player based on last year's production. Well, they got him for 1 million. So, you know, a, a reasonable price. And even the returning veterans, Smith and Russell, uh, controversial as those extensions may be, in each case, those guys took a hefty reduction in pay like he didn't just gift them and you know another year at the same terms that they had before they uh they had to uh come in at a significantly lower cap hit and then finally the tyson berry contract where you know term, terms like uh five and six million dollars were being thrown around on there and they just made an offer 3.75 take it or leave it apparently and he took it so I'm not sure you can point to any one contract they signed this summer and say that's a ridiculous overpay for that guy. I mean, the, the, the enemies of Mike Smith and Chris Russell might say that, but uh, you know, I think a good case can be made that uh, that uh, Holland drove a fairly hard bargain, uh, even in those cases. That's a good point, and uh, sounds like it'd be a future blog post for you, Bruce. Just maybe you've already made that point in a blog, but digging into that and kind of hope, yeah. Uh, I like, I like that. I'm just going to check up on Twitter here to see if there's any news on, uh, nothing on the Oilers own website other than Raphael Lavoie with a pair of snipes in, uh, Al Svenskin today. Yeah. We're, we're, you and I are hoping to watch some of these games. Oh, the Edmonton oh, Oilers are signed 1.25, like 1.25. There you go. Just popped a top two minutes ago. There we are right on top of it. There we are. Okay. Well, I like I, it. I set my value at 1.125 million, which sounds very precise, but what that figure is is the amount that can be buried in the AHL next year. And to me, the, the range anywhere between the minimum and 375,000 over the minimum, any contract from there can be fully buried in the AHL. Not that I think Chris Russell would ever be anywhere but the press box, but you know, it's sort of a reasonable price. It's close to that. So oh, yeah, he's, yes. he's a lot more acceptable at 1.25 million than he was at 4 million. So let's bear that in mind. If you, if you, if you don't mind the player and hated his contract, well, there's a lot less reason to hate this contract than that one. Yeah. Alrighty. Well, uh, anything else? Any other thoughts? Uh, just one other thing that, um, uh, Tippett said about Mike Smith, and it was uh, uh, basically um, um, reinforcement of what I've written in a, in a column about goaltending about the about the uh, tandem of Koskinen and Smith and the different personality types and how Koskinen is sort of a uh, mind his own business, you know, just calm, cool, collected sort, and how Smith was more of the fiery. Um, you know, team team leader, inspirational type, and and Tippett went out of his way to express basically exactly those points. And I thought, yeah, well, they're 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 reading the same thing, 
And obviously they value that. And again, I'll make the point, as I often do, these are flesh and blood humans that they're building a team with. It's not NHL 2020 where you can sort of assign a value based on statistics and statistics alone. These guys perform different functions in the team and not just on the ice. Ultimately, you do need them to perform on the ice, but they also need to do other things. And clearly, uh, Tippett values the things that Smith brought to the team. And and I think without question, David, we can say that the Oilers were uh, a little more aggressive, a little f- more fiery of a team last year than they had been for the couple of years before. And some of that seemed to emanate right from the, right from the sort of forceful personality that they had in goal half the time. All righty. I think you just, your uh, volume went away there for a sec. Oh, yeah? All right. All right. So, uh, yeah, our next project, Bruce, is we're, we're hoping to watch some games of these players overseas. And if anyone has, like, people are talking about this on hockey TV, and I don't know if I can make it work. I've been trying to get it to work on my computer. I, I can't figure it out. So if you're a, a genius on um, watching Euler players play in Europe in the KHL, Swedish Hockey League, or Finnish Hockey League, please get in touch with Bruce or I. And give give us a hand so we can watch these games. I don't know if you figured it out yet, Bruce, but uh, no, I just have two things. I want it to be free, and I want it to be free of malware. Yeah, as long as it's those two things, I'm real good to sit down and watch a bunch of yeah, games. And, and we're going them. to need fairly explicit instructions. <laughs> I I would suggest you know it's just not just say. Lots of people said, "Go oh, just go to on hockey TV." Well, I went there and damned if I could figure it out. Thing. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Hey, if Tippett can watch Pulley RV, he probably had some someone fly yeah. out to set it up on his computer. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> oh, anyway, hopefully we can figure that out so we can start giving live reports of Pulley RV and Broberry from Sweden and Finland, Sveria and Suomi. All right, thanks, Bruce. Thanks right. for talking. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. Let me see here. Turn this off.